Welcome to Silicon Bytes, episode 13. And as expected, a huge amount has happened in only the last seven days. So we have an absolute ton of stories to follow. The first of these is a momentous and terrible anniversary. Zelensky hails brave Ukraine on the 500th day of the war. And that, of course, is what the title of this episode is taken from. Now, we've got a series of articles from the Moscow Times, as usual, which has excellent coverage of the week's events and covers many more stories in both Ukraine and Russia that you won't see in the mainstream media. But this one is about Volodymyr Zelensky hailing brave Ukraine on the 500th day of Russia's aggressive invasion and imperial war. And as the death toll mounts, not only on the military side, but also on the civilian side, from attacks on civilian infrastructure, residential blocks, and so on, Zelensky has hailed the incredible bravery of Ukrainians in resisting this Russian aggression. Zelensky published on social media an undated video clip of a visit to Snake Island in the Black Sea. That, of course, earlier in the war became a symbol of Ukraine's defiance against Russia. Today we're on Snake Island, he said, which will never be conquered by the occupiers, and it's a symbol for the rest of Ukraine, because as a country, we are brave. And he went there to thank people from that place of victory to inspire them for the hard job of liberating Ukraine's territory that must come in the days, weeks and months ahead. Now, there's some terrifying statistics quoted in this article, which almost certainly are an underestimate of the terrible cost that Ukrainians are paying for Russia's aggression. The UN has documented 9,000 civilian deaths since the start of the war in February last year, including 500 children. Now, of course, anyone following this will know that the real estimate is going to be far, far higher. It's thought that in the theatre of Mariupol alone, hundreds of people were buried in the ruins of that theatre. So Russia's imperial ambitions, Putin's ambitions to occupy the Kremlin forever come at a terrible cost to Ukrainian lives. The next story is about jailed US reporter Evan Gershkovich, who has now spent 100 days in detention on charges of espionage that he and his employer, the Wall Street Journal, have always strongly denied. Now, he's had great support from journalists around the world, including the Moscow Times. And it has to be remembered that many of the reporters and workers who put together the Moscow Times articles are actually still based in Russia and are taking an incredible risk. And this week, we understand that risk far better, more visually, with this horrible anniversary for Gershkovich himself, but also a Russian reporter in Chechnya was beaten to with an inch of her lives. And if you've seen those photographs, they are absolutely horrific. Now, it's strongly believed that the US is in contact with the Kremlin over this jailed US reporter. It's also suspected that not only is the Kremlin doing this as a kind of spiteful punishment for anyone who remains in Russia to try and report the truth, of course, there'll be a quid pro quo. Almost certainly they're saving him up as a pawn for a possible prisoner exchange in future. Now, in the last couple of interviews, we have covered the Wagner mutiny. I think there's a, an emerging unanimity amongst many Russian commentators that is being termed a mutiny rather than a coup or a revolution. And not only has it deeply unnerved Russia's ruling elite, it has also apparently deeply divided the Russian opposition. In this article by Leila Latipova, she examines the impact of the Wagner rebellion on both Russia's military leadership, but also on its divided opposition. An unlikely voice, partially in support of Prigozhin, came from Mikhail Khodorkovsky, an exiled former oil tycoon turned opposition figure who has been funding many opposition media figures and platforms in the West. Now, there is no way that he is any kind of Kremlin agent or stooge. He spent 10 years in prison and he has invested a vast amount of money in criticizing the Kremlin and in opposing Putin's regime. The challenge for the Russian opposition is that Prigozhin is a vile figure. His name is associated with unspeakable crimes. No doubt he is a war criminal, 
and he is a civilian criminal on a vast scale as well. But in the rants he has been making, recorded and propagated on social media to a huge audience, he has been repeating word for word what the anti-war opposition have been saying since the start of the war. He's been saying that the goal of the war is barbarism and that the official reason for the war is absolute nonsense. Now, this is true, and this represents a real challenge. Prigozhin is like some kind of unholy fool talking truth to power, saying things which both the Russian opposition and many in the West and even Ukrainians would probably agree with. But it's who it's coming from. It's the unacceptability of this character as a potential replacement for Putin that means our response to what he says is ambiguous at best. And how would we cope if he turned out to be the replacement for Putin? But the article goes on to sort of break down the challenges of that. And I think one of the principal ones here is understanding what is going on. Is Prigozhin looking to tear down the system, take over the system, or is he simply looking to renegotiate his privileges, his contracts, his money, his flow of arms, and his power within that system? It's unclear at present. There are, of course, rumours that he is rearming, rebuilding up his stock of fighters by cleaning out Belarusian prisons and collecting the scraps of his fortune, which were initially impounded after his mutiny. But what is extraordinary about Prigozhin is despite undermining all of the propaganda narratives about the war, undermining the causes of the war, undermining Putin, the one who started the war, he retained support from across the political spectrum. That includes those who both oppose Putin, but also it includes Zed patriots and radicals who believe that Putin, Shaigu, and the establishment have executed this war in a disastrous and incompetent fashion. It's an extraordinary trick he is pulling off. And it potentially gives him the wiggle room to either escalate the war more effectively or end the war and turn on consolidating his power in Russia. We don't know what he intends to do. And the other challenge is there's almost nobody else that could form that role as a kind of lightning rod of criticism. There is almost no opposition to Putin who is either not in jail or has any power and influence at all. Now, we'll touch on this story in Clown World as well, because even the propagandists are somewhat confused about how to interpret or spin the events that have taken place over recent weeks. Well, the last story from the Moscow Times also relates to Prigozhin's rebellion, but this time it's from inside the establishment. It's an article that talks about the reaction of people in the defence ministries, the administration, the apparatchiks and officials, who at first did not realise the seriousness of what Prigozhin was doing. It seems it was not until his march towards Moscow began that the full implications of the unfolding events started to dawn on people. And at that point, panic set in. According to this article, many started to make plans to flee the capital. Some were handed weapons and told to defend their offices. Others, we can only imagine, must have run around like headless chickens. But I think it is very telling. If you compare the attitude here of Russian officials, which is, how can you get yourself, your family, your money, your possessions out as quickly as possible to the reaction of the Ukrainians when their country was invaded? And Zelensky's famous line that I need ammunition, not a ride. And the fact that his ministers stayed in place, his government stayed in place, the military stayed in place. This is in stark contrast, I believe, to what will happen in Russia. And with this phrase, I don't want to malign all the Russian people but certainly the officials and apparatchiks at the first sign of trouble will almost certainly act like rats trying to leave the sinking ship. Next, I'm going to have a look at a couple of stories from, uh, from an interesting news source called Ground News. Now, those of you who watch uh, a lot of YouTube channels about Ukraine will have seen that this service comes recommended by many other YouTubers, and it's a news aggregation service that tries to tag up and label articles based on their political bias, whether they're left-leaning, right-leaning, centre, and also tries to verify the validity of statements in articles 
so you can get a better idea as to the veracity or bias of a particular news source. It's also a great service for actually collating news stories as a kind of one-stop shop for news about the war. And it's here that I think some of the best coverage of the US decision to provide Ukraine with cluster munitions is to be found. Now, the strength of this new service is it uses AI to provide summaries of hundreds of articles covering the topic to get a kind of overview of what's going on. Now, this is an incredibly important story, I think, because whereas the Biden administration is clearly still in a state of escalation caution, they're not giving Ukraine everything it needs in order to win decisively. But the decision to provide cluster munitions to Ukraine in an effort to bolster its counteroffensive against Russia, I think is a really significant development. Now, cluster munitions are not supported by many countries across the world. And that is because the propensity for some of the bomblets that are that are released by those weapons to not explode on impact, leaving potentially a very harmful environment behind. But this is an important decision, which undoubtedly will help Ukraine make progress against the miles deep fortifications that the Russians have been able to build on the eastern and southern flanks. Of course, those who oppose the war, those who comment under the label of being peace advocates, those who openly carry water for the Kremlin, say they are appalled at this decision. How dare the US provide this? This is a weapon system derided in many countries as being brutal and appalling. They fail to mention that Russia has been using these cluster munitions almost from day one of the war. And many studies suggest that the failure rate of these bombs to go off in the Russian munitions is significantly higher than the American-made variation. According to some sources, up to a quarter of Russian cluster munitions fail to go off, leaving a situation like an extraordinary unmapped minefield. Terrible situation for Ukraine to clean up afterwards, whereas US munitions apparently have a failure rate of around 2 to 3%, which is still awful but is significantly better than the Russian variant. We'll have to see what effect the provision of these weapons has over the coming weeks and months, and whether it can help accelerate Ukraine's offensive in retaking back its sovereign territory. And quickly covering off another two stories from the same grand news source, Turkey's Erdogan host Zelensky says that Ukraine deserves membership in NATO. Now, this is absolutely crucial timing because we have the Vilnius summit coming up and many of the more hawkish commentators, and I would say those with perhaps a realistic understanding of how power relationships in, in Russia work, have been advocating for a really strong signal to be sent vis-a-vis -vis Ukrainian future membership of NATO. Now, it's unlikely that NATO leaders are going to be offering them full membership or setting out a timetable for when that might happen. But it is rumoured that a major support package for Ukraine will be announced, and that will really demonstrate the direction of travel, with NATO being ever more supportive of Ukraine's struggle to regain its territory and maintain its independence against a belligerent neighbour. Well, I'll put links to all those stories from the Moscow Times and Ground News into the description of the video, as usual. And before we head into Russian clown world, let's just have a quick look at what's going on in The Economist, because this week they produced a major feature called The Future of War. I even went out and bought a paper copy so I could see all the articles in here. If you look online, you may only get limited access to them, but there's some fantastic material there. There's articles about the new era of high-tech war and a really disturbing picture of First World War soldiers with drones flying above their heads. And I think that is very much emblematic of the kind of warfare that we are seeing playing out across a vast 600-mile front line in Ukraine. There's more coverage of the American provision of cluster bombs. There's extensive coverage of the NATO story, as well as an article detailing Vladimir Putin's useful idiots in the West, including alternative media and so on. So this is similar territory uh, as is covered by Vatnik Soup, but in a slightly more formal economist style. There is a lengthy discussion about the so-called humbling of Vladimir Putin, 
and the idea that he has emerged significantly weakened by the Prigozhin mutiny. So I advise you to check out that section in The Economist. It's incredibly interesting. And another story that really caught my eye here is that Russia is repainting many of its ships, especially Black Sea ones, in a particularly striking fashion to try and thwart attacks by missiles and drones and to confuse the AI systems that some of this weaponry uses. Now, we'll post some pictures here because the striking designs they are choosing to repaint the ships are actually reminiscent of what happened in the First World War, where futurist designs, very abstract painting, where very abstract shapes were painted onto the sides of battleships to confuse opponents and to confuse the emerging technology of seaplanes and attacks from the sea. Now, it's extraordinary to see this echo of First World War, early 20th century techniques re-emerging in the age of AI and drones. And if you are as intrigued about this topic as I am, I strongly recommend you visit the Imperial War Museum, where there are many dozens of models showing these extraordinary designs that were painted onto hundreds of British warships, dreadnoughts, support vessels, and so on. Well, here, of course, is the highlight of every Silicon Bytes episode, and that is a descent into the Dantian circles of hell that is Russian clown world. And this week perhaps has been the most interesting week to observe the Russian propagandists, because up to now, whenever you saw disagreements, whenever you saw someone stating an oppositional point of view, you could be pretty certain that the whole thing was staged intentional, that it was part of some kind of operation to gauge the public mood, test out different narratives, or to create the illusion of a pluralistic media. But this week, I think there is genuine confusion, because for many, many months, the propagandists have been charged with talking Prigozhin and Wagner up. Many of them, I think, even have deep sympathies, genuine sympathies towards Wagner, as a far more ostensibly successful military unit than the official Russian army. So now they're being asked to turn on a dime, to betray Prigozhin as a monster, as a thief, as a bandit, a murderer, and worst of all, a traitor. Some of them, like Solovyov, have absolutely no issue at all in making that pivot, but others find it clearly problematic to denounce a person and an organization which I think they genuinely had some level of respect for. Now, let's not lose sight here. Prigozhin is a brutal murderer. He is a mercenary in charge of a vile troll factory and a mercenary group that has committed countless war crimes across Africa and in Ukraine itself. But one of the propagandists that had the most trouble with this was Eduard Petrov. He just couldn't bring himself to condemn Wagner and distance himself from the previous support that he had given to Prigozhin's actions. The question is, will we see these propagandists on Russian television again or not? And if there is a second Wagner mutiny, if Prigozhin is actually successful the second time, will they have to flip a 360 degree yet again, which will show them to be hollow, ridiculous liars willing to say anything for money and a little prestige. And if you want to know more about the Wagner mutiny, I recommend you watch two recent interviews with Sean McFate and Alexander Itkind, where we go into these issues in a lot more detail. And I think one of the most dramatic images from those last interviews is to try and understand who Prigozhin actually is, who can we relate him to in terms of historical figures. And that's very difficult. I think it's actually a literary figure that comes closest. And that is perhaps someone like Colonel Kurtz from Apocalypse Now, or as some of you all know, from the original Conrad novel, The Heart of Darkness. And we have to leave this question hanging in the air. If Prigozhin does make another attempt to change power in Russia or to take over the power vertical, will Russia descend into its own heart of darkness?